Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I am Vlad, and my guest today is American Huddle, who used to be known as American Huddle 4, but got banned on Twitter. And now he's Huddle American. You can follow him for, I guess, five more days until he gets banned once again and comes back with some other account. <laughs> and this episode is sponsored by my friend who has this business with audio consulting for podcasts. The name of the business is Adol. It's a new audio consulting firm that accepts Bitcoin and they offer a full range of services like editing, audio restoration, troubleshooting, recording, and consulting. And you can visit their website, which is audio.com with no dash. So audio.com for more information. And he also has an email contact at contact at audioaudio.com. He works in Los Angeles with some big time musicians, but he wants to move full time to producing Bitcoin podcasts. So if you want great sound for your podcast, you should t- totally call Adel, which sounds like a cool name. So hello, American Huddle. It's nice to hear you after this Adel commercial. Vlad, it's hey, it's great to be on the podcast. We've been trying to set this up for a long time, and then uh, we were supposed to do it yesterday, and I got I got banned again for the four, fifth time, fourth time. I don't know. I can't I can't keep track. Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> I was looking for you, and then I saw that there's no chat record on Twitter, and I said to myself, <laughs> "What's wrong?" Because I, I remember we spoke a day before that. <laughs> we set a time for the podcast. Uh, you know, the, the reason I keep getting kicked off, people keep asking me, they're like, what do you keep doing to get kicked off Twitter? And it's because I have oppositional defiant disorder, <laughs> which just means I can't accept authority. So I know that there's Twitter has rules and, you know, these rules are very leftist and left leaning. So if I just keep using language that they feel is, you know, homophobic or, transphobic or racist, then I'll just keep getting uh, suspended. And it's not that I am any of those things. Like I'm not, I'm not homophobic. I'm not transphobic. I'm not racist, but I just hate, I hate rules and authority. So I can't help myself when I know there's a system in place. I just want to keep poking and prodding the system until I break it. And uh, that's what continues to happen to me. I guess that's why we all got into Bitcoin, right? Oh, 100%. Just want to test yeah. stuff, whatever political system we are a part of. I, th- I think Bitcoiners in general are the type of kids in the back of the class who are like, hey, that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> like, I'm sure we were all disruptive types like that. I know I was growing up. And uh, I, th- I think it's important to hold on to that, you know, sort of fuck you attitude, for lack of a better word. Because when you're, when you're young, when you're in kindergarten or, you know, I don't know what they call it in Romania, but when you're, when you're little and you go to school um, and they tell you to draw a picture of a, like, let's say a bear and you draw your own version of a bear, they, they give you an F and they say, that's not what a bear looks like. Right. And so it's the kids that say, no, this, this is my version of a bear. And they, <laughs> they maintain their fuck you attitude who actually, uh, keep hold of their creativity and that ability to question things is, uh, I think it's, I think it's very important and we should be instilling it in children instead of going the opposite direction, which we often do. Oh yeah, I agree. I guess the most important kind of education is that of learning how to think and how to question whatever you're learning, as opposed to accepting everything that you learn as being valid because it comes from some sort of authority. Yeah, very much so. And, uh, you know, that's obviously the big why at the center of, of Bitcoin is none of, I think none of us had ever really thought about money uh, very in depth. And then Bitcoin comes along and you're like, oh, shit, none of this makes any sense. <laughs> and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper and you find out that the rabbit hole is, is basically endless. And, uh, you know, that's where the journey started for me, at least. I'm, I'm sure it was similar for you. I have a background in political science, 
And that's, oh, so you, yeah, you probably knew more than I did. Yeah, but I didn't see much behind the curtain. So mm. it all seemed technical and it made sense in this very scientific framework, which they designed to analyze politics. But I guess also the presidency of Donald Trump has helped just take away the curtains and realize that it's all a shit show. And it's not like yeah. it has become a shit show. It's just more obvious now than it was before. It's all a right. joke. Right. Well, the, you know, the central bank types are, are just like Donald Trump because they're just making it up as they go. At least with Trump, he's so stupid he can't hide it. You know, these guys that are smart, they hide it very well. And you, you kind of, you know, you listen to them when you don't know it very much yourself. And you think, well, okay, obviously these men are very smart and very well studied. And there must be some, some great reasoning behind all these negative interest rates and all this continuous printing of money and raising the debt ceiling. And then you find out, no, they're just winging it, <laughs> just like Donald Trump is. Oh, I remember something which I read from Vital Buterin. Right. He said that the purpose of 2% annual inflation is also psychological. So employees get the impression that they get a raise every year and they get better at their work, which is dumb. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And it's all, but you know, it has a reverse effect that nobody ever talks about, which is sticker shock. Um, you know, if Keynesianism is so good for the economy, how come people spend less and less money as they age? It's because prices keep going up and your point of reference shifts. So the car that cost $6,000 when you were a child now costs $60,000 and that affects consumer uh, behavior. So when you're, you know, when you get to be elderly, like beyond 50, you stop spending as much money. I never thought about this, but it makes so much sense. That's why my mother, right. for example, when I talk to her, she has a different reference and a different way of understanding money. And whenever I tell her, hey, look, mom, I bought these sneakers, and she's going to be like, how much did they cost? And I basically evaluate the cost in reasonable terms for her. And usually it's twice as low, twice as cheap, meaning... Yeah, no, totally. The, uh, you know, I think, I think the world is always just in a, a fight between top-down architecture of systems and emergent phenomena. Nobody, you know, yes, yes, Satoshi uh, coded Bitcoin and invented Bitcoin. But what's happening after that initial zero to one moment, that innovation, is all an emergent phenomena bubbling upwards. Whereas people like Vitalik, who think they're smarter than everybody else, think that they can architect a system that will basically be perfect and have no problems. And, you know, I think I'm smarter than everybody, too. But, you know, I'm humble enough to know that I'm not. <laughs> and I get it wrong often. And these, these types of people, like the central bankers or like Vitalik or like, you know, any of the other shit coiners, um, they, they basically think that they're going to be able to prevent black swans and you can't prevent black swans because that's an unknown unknown, right? You don't know what you don't know. Now we have unknown unknowns in Bitcoin too, but in my view, they're mainly positive things that are going to emerge upwards and not negative things that are going to come crashing down on the system. I like that Nassib Taleb reference. Right. It's, I love I love Taleb. I think he's uh, Taleb is one of our best Bitcoiners that uh, not a lot of people bring up. I'm not sure. Did he endorse Bitcoin? Oh yeah, yeah. He wrote the foreword for uh, Safe's book. Okay, I, I feel embarrassed for not knowing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, look. Just go on Twitter and type in Taleb Bitcoin, and there's a bunch. There's a bunch of stuff he said about it before. And uh, he made a lot, I think he made a lot of money off of it in 17. Who hasn't, really? Right. Well, Taleb is super rich, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and incredibly smart. And he's a disagreeable asshole, just like all the rest of us. So he fits in perfectly with the Bitcoiners, you know. Also about what you were saying about 
you know, these types of people who think they have it all figured out and they're going to convince the rest of the world that they're smart, so they should be followed. I read something which was written by Nick Sabo just today. I think it was retweeted by Donald McIntyre, who is a business associate of his. And it basically said that scientists and science in general are part of the government generally. You have these people who get funded by government funds and grants and research projects. And it's hard for them to think outside this framework. They're being taught from the very first years of their education about what is wrong and what is right. And it, when they become researchers and they try to apply some kind of methodology to whatever questions they're asking, they basically just reaffirm what they have been taught. And they don't take much time being Socratic in the sense that they ask questions and they try to be contrarian. They just reaffirm whatever scientific biases are being fed to them. Yeah, science is, yes. I, I agree with that uh, statement and that sentiment. And also there's a very natural inclination in the sciences, even when you don't have government uh, interference or regulation, to not champion the ideas of fellow scientists uh, while they're alive. So let's say you, you started your, um, you know, your work and your career and you started researching into you know, this area and it got more narrow as you went along. And then somebody else who did the inverse of what you did, you started to get the growing sense that they were right, right? You can't exactly champion their idea because it makes you look weak and it makes you look stupid. And this is a human fallibility thing. Whereas when a, another scientist has died, you can now bring their ideas to the forefront because they basically they don't get the credit and you get all the credit for championing that idea. And that's just a very human thing that we see repeated over time. So science is a very slow process, just like, you know, just like Bitcoin is because it's an emergent phenomena. All emergent phenomena are going to be slow and you can make it even slower with government regulation, which is basically what they've done. I guess according to that article, that we need some kind of separation between state and science. Don't you think we need a separation of state and everything? <laughs> Possibly. Maybe yeah. I don't agree with private armies and some other concepts. But, I mean, I don't think everything should be private. I'm okay with some kind of neutral police that is hypothetically not partisan to the interests of a small group of citizens, even though they might be? I think what we have to ask ourselves is, we know that government is always going to grow and it's always going to centralize and it's always going to be a centralizing force, right? And I struggle with it just like you do. Like, you know, especially because we were just talking about how the scientists are brought up in their own dogmatic um, reality where they can't see what's around them. Well, we're just like that because we've never lived in a world without government intervention or interference. So we can't really fully conceptualize of a world that would exist without it, especially because the time that we live in is the time where the global state is bigger than it has ever been in the history of humanity. Nobody's ever seen a behemoth quite like this. So I think it's very hard for us to conceptualize. So I like to, I like to try and not say definitively that the government is good at this or is bad at that. Um, although they seem to be terrible at everything. <laughs> yep. But I think, I think knowing that you're inside a dogma is very important. You know, it's like, it's very hard to talk to your friends who are no coiners because they're still in the matrix. Right. And, uh, you've taken the red pill and you've seen for yourself, you know, and you went through the hero's journey where you had to, all your muscles were atrophied you know, you woke up on the Nebuchadnezzar and Morpheus was staring you in the face being like, Oh shit, it's real now. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they haven't gone through any of that journey. So you go back into the matrix as somebody who's quote unquote woke and you try and tell them what it is, but nobody can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. And uh, so figuring out how to get people to go on that hero's journey when most people just don't want to take any responsibility for their own life. God, that's such a hard 
question that I ask myself all the time, and I never come up with good answers. So, so far we have had a Joseph Campbell reference, and before that, <laughs> Nassib Taleb reference, and now we're talking about the Matrix. And we are supposed to have some kind of debate about the Matrix, right? Oh, that's right, because me and you were um, arguing on Twitter about whether uh, Agent Smith <laughs> or what, what, whether uh, Neo was needed at the end of the Matrix to reset the system. And my, my point, my contention was that Smith had already taken over the Matrix in Revolutions, and he's the entire Matrix. And Neo goes to the Machine City, and he bargains with the machines because he knows that he's the opposite piece of Smith, and he's the only one that can stop it. So he basically, Neo hard resets the system, uh, but it's like they're joined. You know, so I don't know if you can say that Smith or Neo does it, but without Neo's interference, the system would not have reset. I don't know about that. I mean, the Matrix at the time when Smith had taken over was just his new system, which was being reset by default because he was everything. So he was building a different society. And when Neo resets it, we're not sure if Agent Smith is completely gone or if he just lost part of his power and he's going to attempt to retake it, reclaim it. What we know is that the architect has been watching all along and we're not sure if Agent Smith had taken over him, but he took over the Oracle, which we saw. Right. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is why the this is why the first matrix is the best matrix and the other matrices are you know just okay <laughs> i mean they also have these scenes with the fights in what's the name of their city zion zion right and they fight with the robots and it's paced very strangely and conveniently like it's a lot more cheesy than other matrix films right yeah, the first, oh man, the first Matrix is just, it's one of the best pieces of art. It's probably the best film of the last 30 years, uh, bar none. I can't think of any that are better. It's very well made, and not just in terms of cinematography. It's just telling the story of Plato's cave, but in a way that's relatable to people who are into technology. And this idea right. of virtual reality and living inside a dream. I mean, Inception also did a great job at portraying this kind of universe. I, I, like, Incep I like Inception too, not as much as I like uh, The Prestige or The Dark Knight or some of Nolan's uh, better films, in my opinion. But I agree, I agree. This is very challenging. But interesting, because we get to speak about so many topics and we seem to have the same cultural references. Well, that's the, that's the interesting thing is like, I think because of the internet, the reason that we can all align uh, is because we kind of grew up with similar cultures. Uh, you know, at least, at least pop culture was very similar, I think, for all of us. Because, you know, a lot of it is American. I'm assuming you saw a lot of American movies when you were a kid. All the time. Right, because they're the best movies. They're, they're the biggest, yeah, they're the biggest and the best, and they have the biggest budgets and the most money, you know. It's, it's interesting, though, but it's interesting, too, because, you know, you're in Romania, a place I've never been. I have no cultural understanding about. I literally, I literally don't know anything about Romania, and me and you have a lot of shared interest and shared touch points that we can connect on, which is just fascinating, uh, you know, in so many different ways. I mean, when we were kids, right, you know, you're, you're, me and you are around the same age. So we're still of that generation where we got to see the internet be born. And I probably remember it a little more than you do, but uh, it was pretty crazy to grow up in the analog world and then see the transition to the digital world. And I, I almost feel like we're keepers of the flame in a sort of way where um, you ever read that book, The Giver? You know that book? No. Uh, in, in The Giver, you know, basically society, you know, takes away all their bad memories and they uh, transfer it to one person. And that's 
that's the kid and they, they pick a kid and then they give the kid the cultural memory of the world's, you know, sort of terrible things that have happened. Uh, they made it into a really shitty movie. It's not very good, but the book is good. And I, I, I sort of feel like we are that generation where we have the memory of how things used to be. Because when you talk to young kids, you know, who are like 19, 20, I saw you were, I saw you were saying you were uh, talking, to, <laughs> talking to younger girls and you couldn't understand them. Oh, no. They're on Snapchat <laughs> doing all sorts of shit. <laughs> right. Snapchat. I, this is why I'm glad I'm married, because when I talk to them, I'm just like, hey, uh, when are you going to shut the fuck up? Because now would be a great time. <laughs> I wish uh, I found the right girl, but I haven't so far. How is... Uh... <laughs> Us men are much dumber in this sense. So when we get a girlfriend, we're like, oh, this is okay. I can imagine myself marrying this woman, but something goes wrong along the way. Yeah, it's sort of, you know, for guys, it's more like, uh, for girls, I think it's more the person. And for guys, I think it's more the time in your life. So you may be getting to the time in your life where you're like, you know, ready to settle down and be with a girl or, you know, I don't know. I don't know either. But <laughs> I wanted to say that Bitcoin, in my view is only a digital currency because it had to be in order for it to not be confiscated. But the idea, right. and I feel like it has grown and has been around for a long time. I guess I, yeah. the 16th century really wanted to have Bitcoin because they would find gold and treasures and riches and big titty bitches. <laughs> they had no way to go back to their countries and spend it without getting arrested. So they had to sail at sea. They had to bury their treasures. They had to go to America. And that's why some cities on the East Coast of the United States are so developed because they basically benefited from the gold of pirates. Yep. No, yeah, totally. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, I think we've been living through um, this 100-year period from like the early 1900s to the early 2000s of centralization that was very unnatural uh, in, in the historical uh, framework that we're used to. You know, you look at things like having the, having the news media be controlled or having the state be heavily controlled or having money be controlled by the state. These are all very new, recent, strange developments uh, that didn't occur in the vast, you know, time span of human history. So I think in, in some ways, while what we're doing is very new and revolutionary, but in some ways, we're just going back to the past. Uh, and it's, it's sort of interesting to think about. Also, Bitcoiners seem to like the analog world much more. So even though we transact with the kind of currency that no coiners perceive as being new technology, which is digital and it's not tangible, it's hard for them to perceive how it works and to understand what a full node is and why we use it. But basically, we, we are using digital gold in our minds. We use something that cannot be confiscated and cannot be censored. And that's the whole value proposition of Bitcoin as opposed to sending I, cash payments. I, I, I can't remember if this is a real... Um a real story from history, or if this is just a construct of, of, I think it was Milton Friedman, but somebody had the idea, I think it was Friedman, but basically there's an island, and on the island are a series of very large boulders that can't be moved, and every day ownership of those boulders changes, and all the participants of the island note the change. And that's, that's basically... That's what Bitcoin is, just in digital form. Okay. Because if you think about it, your, your Bitcoin doesn't move. You know, your Bitcoin is just always on the network in the cloud. And your key is your, your accessibility to that, to that Bitcoin. Right. Right. So, like, in a way, these are, these are just giant stones in the sky and the ledger is noting the change of ownership of these stones, but the stones themselves never move. That's a good metaphor to understand it. Right. 
I think it was, I think it comes from a Milton Friedman book, although I can't remember. Sometimes I like to think that Bitcoin as a currency needs the existence of cash as a way, uh, at least until hyper Bitcoinization, you need to do this kind of quick swap that doesn't get recorded in any bank ledger. You just go mm. party and exchange Bitcoins for cash. That's it. It's the most private form of payment ever. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you have, have you ever thought much about the symbiotic relationship between fiat currency and Bitcoin? Mm, in which sense, symbiotic? Well, just in a lot of senses. Like, um, it almost feels like we are a parasite on the global network of of, fiat, of the legacy systems, right? And that we're just soaking up their blood supply until at some point they're going to ride on the back of us once we become large enough. And it, there's got to be a, some sort of a weird transitionary period there. This isn't an idea I've really fleshed out very far, but, you know, there's obviously, Bitcoin wouldn't exist without a fiat monetary system, right? We'd just be still on gold and then we'd have some digital form of gold probably. Or, you know, we'd have fiat backed gold and then a digital form of fiat backed gold. So we needed the system to be this fucked up to get the invention that is Bitcoin. And so from the very inception, I think there's a sort of symbiosis there. I agree with this. And I know that Saifedean is touring with a new presentation, which is called How to Kill Bitcoin or something like that. And it basically mm -hmm. is that the best way to kill Bitcoin and make it basically pointless would be to return to the gold standard, which is never going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, I think Bitcoiners would reject a gold standard because we know about the problems that the gold has and we know about the history of the centralization of gold and we are going to assume that that's going to happen again. Um, whereas we don't know, we don't know what happens next for Bitcoin. And, you know, this is where people like to come in and say, well, it's going to get centralized because of this or that. And we just don't know. We haven't gone through this process yet with Bitcoin. We've been through it with gold for 5,000 years and it continually gets re-centralized. There has been so much speculation with Bitcoin getting more centralized. And back in 2014, 2015, Gavin Andreessen was bragging about it by saying, oh, I'm going to make Bitcoin more centralized. And it hasn't happened because the community basically understood what Bitcoin stands for. And no kind of benevolent dictator was able to maneuver the direction in which Bitcoin headed. I don't, I don't think we should ever let Gavin forget the fact that he was fooled by Craig Wright in front of the world in the most embarrassing way possible. <laughs> I mean, if anybody ever takes him seriously after that little stunt with the BBC ever again, uh, it's, it's to their own detriment. I think there's more to it than that, because if Craig Wright wanted to prove the ownership of the coins, he could just sign a message on the Genesis block. And right. Gavin could take a look at it. But Gavin actually went to London and was fooled by a laptop, which was owned by Craig Wright, and he was able to forge whatever evidence that he showed. So what's the point of traveling to meet somebody and then attest and confirm that he's Satoshi if this is not part of some kind of setup or conspiracy? Mm. Well, I think, I don't know, that, that reads a little too much into it for me. I think that Gavin was just incredibly out of his depth and that he also didn't really fully understand what Bitcoin was, which to be fair to Gavin, none of us did at the time. Because like I said, it's an emergent phenomenon. So we didn't quite know what it was going to be. I mean, I fell for a lot of the same false narratives that I'm sure you fell for and we all fell for, which is like, oh, it's a payment system. It's for remittances. It's spend and replace. We're banking the unbanked, you know, all that kind of stuff. While we do help the unbanked and we give poor people a place to store their time, uh, I don't think Bitcoiners have really thought very hard about the last mile. Um, you know, you, me and you were just talking about local Bitcoins before the show. Like that last mile of like going to, you know, actually exchange the Bitcoin into fiat is that's the whole thing. That's the hard part. Everything else is easy.
right? So it's like a lot of these false narratives propagated. And I, I think Gavin, I think Gavin fell for a lot of them and a lot of people did and they spun up altcoins and all sorts of crazy shit. And uh, we're still dealing with some of the consequences from some of those false narratives. I guess also in the case of Gavin, you have to think and consider the fact that he went to talk to the CIA. Right, which is when Satoshi leaves the project. And all of his attempts were to increase the block size. Mm -hmm. That was the whole point. And, and to some extent, Bitcoin Cash supporters claim that the plan was all along to increase the block size and then they changed their opinion because they realized that we can live with one megabyte blocks and basically soft fork and improve the network to the to maybe the extent where transactions are smaller. So instead of making blocks bigger, why not fit more transactions into them? Which is smart and conservative and elegant. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the the big blockers are are just are just stupid. <laughs> like I just I don't think they understand the issue, you know. Of course they don't, because they're going to be like, <laughs> why do you need to verify each and every transaction on the network? Why do you right. have all my transactions? No, they're private. What the hell are you talking about? It's a public ledger. Right. Like, it's like, it's like Roger Ver. Like, I don't think Roger Ver is a very smart guy. You know, I don't think he has a very high IQ. Uh, I think he's an average guy. I'm not going to call him a dumb guy, but I think he just fully misunderstands what's happening. And, you know, he also has an insane, like he's literally insane. <laughs> he has an insane ideological bent that leads him to believe that you need to get to medium, uh, you know, of exchange before you get to store of value, which doesn't make any fucking sense. But, you know, back in the day, we all had to go through these thought processes alone and on our own and uh, figure them out for ourselves. And some people came to false conclusions and You know, in the case of like, let's say Roger, he totally destroyed his entire reputation, uh, which I think he feels really sad about. And he should probably feel sad because he had a lot of status in the Bitcoin community. I mean, people called him people called him Bitcoin Jesus for anybody who doesn't know. Back in the day on our Bitcoin or maybe the Bitcoin forums, Roger had to worry about found Bitcoin and he didn't sleep or eat for three days and he was reborn as a as a Bitcoiner. And people started calling him Bitcoin Jesus, and it was super cringy, and I hated it every time it was said. <laughs> and we used to, you know, I, I think in general, even though we were all so hardcore and disagreeable, we probably had, we probably give too much leeway to people that are quote unquote in our camp or in our in group. And I know that I would root on Roger back in the day because he seemed like he was one of us. And then when the Civil War happens, you know, it all falls apart, but we're all mildly culpable for what was going on back then. Now, I'm not saying we should let Roger back in either. Fuck him forever. But <laughs> Gavin too. All of them. I think Roger is very smart, actually. And he knows exactly you do. what he's doing. And he's very persuasive and he's like a snake trying to project some kind of image and promote a brand in which he doesn't really believe in. Because yeah, all did you in mining <laughs> and he holds a big stash of Bitcoins and he owns BitPay, which basically is a payments processor, which accepts BTC. He never gave up on it. He just did, embraced an alternative, which he tried to make bigger than the real Bitcoin, which he failed, but he still made a lot of money. Well, and I guess from a rational actor standpoint, it makes sense to hold Uh, one currency, you know, to hold Bitcoin while also trying to destroy Bitcoin with something that you can gain more control of. But uh, reputationally, it's not good to do that. And he's obviously been dealing with the fallout from it since it happened. You know, I, I don't agree with you that he's smart. I think when I, when I say somebody is smart, that's a pretty high bar. And I, I mean, people like, Adam Back or Nick, Z Nick Zabo or Brian Bishop, uh, you know, Luke Dash, Peter Todd. I mean, those guys are, they're like almost geniuses, all of them. 
I don't disagree with this list of brilliant people, but I disagree with Roger being dumb. I don't think he's dumb. Dumb is the wrong. I'm being hyperbolic. I think he's average intelligence. I, I would I would put his IQ at 100 or 105. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Peter it's dumb. an ins that's an insult in the Bitcoin community. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think you know it's it's obviously people are going to take offense to it, but I think Bitcoiners just tend to be a lot smarter on average than shitcoiners and no coiners. You know. That's fair. I mean, I always have conversations with, you know, low level Bitcoiners, you know, the plebes, as they call themselves. And behind the scenes, all of them are really highly intelligent, distinguished, uh, you know, working on a lot of them are working on Wall Street. It's pretty crazy. I actually got to talk to a few of them. And I was surprised what I found, because when you think about plebs or plebes, it's just a derogatory term, which basically says we are the ones who don't really matter and we're part of the crowd and don't do much interesting in this space. But they have very interesting backgrounds. And this whole third season has been about just random people on Twitter who wanted to get on the podcast. And I said, yeah, why not? What can possibly go wrong? And <laughs> I don't think I have been disappointed once. And there were people I have met for the first time. So we just spoke for 10 minutes and I said, okay, let's do a podcast. What the hell? What can go wrong? Yeah, I think the, I think the Bitcoin plebe thing is a reaction to, um, to 2017 and the shit coinery. And it's sort of a, it's a humbleness. You know, it's saying, I'm nobody, I don't matter. I'm just here to help Bitcoin in any way I can. Um, and, I, you know, there's also an anger that goes along with, some of the Bitcoin plebe stuff, because, you know, a lot of them were straight up lied to <laughs> back during the altcoin run. And they believed a lot of those lies and they're rightfully angry about it because a lot of them got dumped on by people like the Tog Buterin or uh, Joseph Lubin or Justin Suntron or any of the number of shit coiners who popped up at that time. I think one of the best examples is XRP, the standard which at some point had a huge army of supporters, which I'm not sure was organic. It might have been paid, but it doesn't matter. You could not type anything bad about XRP without having them comment on your stuff and possibly having your account reported. Oh, and yeah. Ended. Yeah, it was, it was I, you know, I spent, and maybe I'm dumb too, because I spent a lot of 2017 trying to educate those people and, uh, you know, because there was something that happened, like, you're right, a lot of them were bots, a lot of them were robots, but a lot of them were stupid people who were following the robots. And these stupid people had very normal jobs like landscaper uh, and mechanic. And I don't like seeing, I don't like seeing them get taken advantage of. At the same time, I would try and educate them and they would tell me to fuck myself. So, <laughs> you know... Uh, fuck them. I hope they lose their money and have to go back to working at the mechanic shop. <laughs> Cause I'm not, I'm not going to do it again. This bubble, it's not going to happen. You know, back in December, 2017, I lost about 800 bucks shorting XRP. And it, oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, I basically shorted it when it got close to $1 and I said to myself, there's no way this can get any higher than this. I'm going to short it. And it went to three dollars, and I got wrecked. I had a I had a group of, uh, man, I had a group of people in a Facebook, a Facebook group, when it was at three dollars, telling me it was going to go to a hundred dollars, and I was trying to explain how that's impossible, and literally none of them would listen, and then they kicked me out of their little Facebook group. <laughs> Well, of course, they're going to say, oh, it happened to Bitcoin, but they don't know how this works. They don't look at the market cap. They don't look at the supply, which is immense. I have no idea how it went to $1 in the first place. No, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's also, I also kind of am glad they all got wrecked because what they basically chose to do was bet against Bitcoin because, you know, you, XRP's whole thing is like, we're we're a bank coin. We we work with the banks. We want everything to stay the same. 
And they all chose to buy into that future <laughs> because they thought Bitcoin was going to get crushed. So fuck that. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I take it back. I, I'm glad they lost their money and I hope they lose more. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> just XRP is going to be around for a long time and is one of the oldest doubt coins out there. Right. You know, it, it predates Bitcoin. In fact, I think the tech does. You mean Ripple, Ripple, but not Ripple. Yeah. Ripple was repurposed uh, by XRP after or however. I don't know how it works. I, I don't I don't pay attention to it because it's a very obvious scheme where the corporation dumps on mechanics and landscapers. And I don't know how they haven't been shut down by the U.S. government. It's crazy. I guess they just have too much money. And yeah, they that's... persuade politicians. And it's very strange in the United States because you have elected officials who are basically slaves of whoever donates to their campaigns. And if they pick yep. up a call from somebody who gave them a lot of money and basically put them into office, there's no way for them to say no. And that can be the moment when they take a U-turn and they change their stances on various issues just because that's what the money tells them to do. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's sort of pathetic what has happened um, to America. And I think we're seeing the end of America now, the American empire, which you could argue is a, is a good for the global world. Although it's going to create a power, if it ends too abruptly, it's going to create a power vacuum that's going to be filled by an even worse actor like China or Russia. So I think the best we can hope for is the slow unwinding of the American experiment. I'm not sure if you know, but probably not. But the Romanian president met with Donald Trump last week. <laughs> I'm sorry. My so people, I'm sorry on behalf of my Donald people. Donald Trump's favorites. Because whatever he says, our president is going to be like, oh, yeah, sure, we're going to do that. When Trump was all about saying, I want every member state of the NATO to donate 1% of their GDP for their defense, our president was the first to sign the agreement and say, yeah, we're going to do that. <laughs> and they are such good friends because basically our president is this kind of dummy guy. He's a yes man in relation to the United States. He does whatever Trump says. And what they said they made an agreement and Romania agreed to give more money to the U.S. military. And it's not specifically U.S., it's NATO, but we know how that works. Right. And the United States promised to be to show solidarity to the struggles to get visas for traveling and for work, which means nothing. It's like, yeah, we understand that you have some issues when you get visa to come to our country, but we're going to do something at some point. We're not going to tell you what, but we're not going to tell you when. But we are solidarity, so <laughs> take it as a compliment. Well, um, you know... The whole, the whole world is in solidarity with us, whether they want to be or not, right? Because we're the global reserve currency and we dictate everything that happens in global affairs. Yeah, unfortunately. Which is pretty, it's pretty crazy that you have one large actor who's basically a shadow empire dictating everything that happens around the globe. Um, you want to talk about, you know, sort of, strangling global trade, prosperity, innovation. The American empire does all those things. That's why, that's why Bitcoiners are so focused on the Federal Reserve. You know, and yeah, there are, Europe has their own and you know, there are other central banks across the world. But the Federal Reserve is the big boss for Bitcoin. That's who we have to take down before we're going to see any, anything get better, I think. Right. Let me ask you some questions from the audience because I announced on August the 18th that we would have this podcast and it's been 12 days since then. Beautiful. And Colin Harper, who has been in the podcast in the previous episode and also works for Bitcoin Magazine, wants to know why you chose the American Gothic as your profile picture. 
Uh, so American Gothic is a very famous painting. Uh, it's, it's worldwide famous and it's from, it's of two farmers in the American Midwest. And the story on the painter who painted it, forget how I forgot his name, but he basically traveled the world in, in search of interesting things to paint and then came home and found beauty in the ordinary in these people who just lived this humble life and farm America's uh, farmlands. And I liked it for the idea of just hodling is a very humble act. You know, even though <laughs> I myself may not be a humble person and on Twitter, I, I'm very like braggadocious and, you know, I'm always saying crazy shit. Um, hodling itself is humble by its very nature. I guess that's part of stacking sets. Right. Stay and humble, stack sets. Yep. It was either Matt O'Dell or Hodlow Nut. Right. Matt, I think, I think that one's Matt O'Dell. Yeah. Also, Fart Face 2000 wants to know. <laughs> yeah. He is the second or the first recipient of Hodlow Nut's torch, and he became famous back then. And right now he works on Bit Piggies, which is very interesting. But he wants to know your story because he says he's a sucker for a good story. Um, just my whole story or my Bitcoin story? What do you think I should tell? I don't know. As long as it's good, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, let me think. My story. I mean, you can make something up. Just make a good story. There's no way. Well, to let's. I'll, I'll tell, I can tell the gambling story that I told on another podcast, but no. uh, <laughs> we we want something that you haven't said already. <laughs> um, let me think. Let me think about this. My story. All right. Well, I'll just tell you. I'll just be honest. So I, you know, I grew up all over America. My father was a, you know, corp, high high end corporate lawyer. Uh, we moved around a lot, and you know. My mother was mentally ill, and so I, while my father was out being, uh, you know, a high-end corporate attorney, I kind of had to take care of my mother. And people would, you know, talk shit behind my back and behind my mother's back, and I always felt very defensive over her. And so this gave me like a, a very early distrust of authority figures because a lot of the people that were doing, I'm, I'm a little kid, and a lot of the people that were doing this you know, saying these things about me or about my mother were, um, you know, adults. And so from a very early age, I was just like, fuck these people, basically. And then I grew up and that never went away. And I went through my entire life, you know, just being like, you can't tell me nothing. Fuck you. I'm going to do things the way I'm going to do them and trusting myself internally. So, you know, when I found Bitcoin, it was actually a very natural process for me because I wasn't that ensconced in the dogmatism of American life, uh, you know, or what people were telling me at university. I just sort of have always thought for myself uh, and been a self learner. And I think that's where it all starts for me. So what kind of university studies do you have? So I went to film school. Uh, and so I have a, you know, so the reason we can go deep on film also is because I'm a big cinephile and I could talk about, I could talk about movies for, you know, all day. Uh, so I'm by training, I'm a filmmaker and I run a production company and that's how I get a lot of my, my fiat to stack sets. Impressive. <laughs> I also have a brother who wanted to become a filmmaker but he didn't pass the entrance exam, which supposedly is very hard. And you only have about 20 positions, 20 scholarships every year and uh, 200 or something. So chances were about yeah. 10%. Film is very complex. It's one of those things like Bitcoin. There's a lot to know. Uh, and there's a lot of sub sub disciplines within it. And there's a lot to know within each one of those sub disciplines. When I, when I was starting my training, I wanted to be a cinematographer who's, you know, the person behind the camera who's responsible for the lighting and the camera movement. And uh, I quickly found out it was much too technical for me. Uh, and even though I had a good eye, there's a lot of math involved with these new systems and these new digital cameras. And I wasn't exactly the guy to do the math, you know. 
No, oh, I know. <laughs> that, that's why I'm not coding because I'm not very good at math. Right. Me too. Did I lose you or was this some kind of awkward moments of silence? Awkward moment. <laughs> That's good to know. It's a lot better than losing you. So if Bitcoin was a movie, what kind of genre do you think it would be? And who would be the main Ooh. characters so far? Oh, what kind of genre? You know, I think it's sci-fi. Right? I, I think animation. I, I think it's sci-fi, if I had to say. And well, who would so be the main... Not a documentary? No, well, yeah, you could do it as that. But documentaries are boring. And they've all become propaganda pieces. I don't know if you watched the documentary in the last 10 years, but you know, documentaries now, they have, a, they, have a, they have a presupposition. And the documentarian goes in uh, in order to confirm his findings. And lo and behold, he always does. So they're propaganda pieces these days. Um, I, I think Bitcoin's science fiction, man. It's, it's basically like the credit system from Star Trek, you know? I haven't watched much Star Trek, to be honest. So I, I don't know. Oh, you're not, a, you're not a Star Trek guy? No, I don't know Klingon. <laughs> well, I know that, I know that Bake is going to be very disappointed in you. I know he's a big Star Trek guy. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm too young to have watched Star Trek. I could have watched it at some point when I had too much spare time and that was in university. I wish I got into Bitcoin around the time, but I, I didn't. Oh my God, I know. I was in, I was in college back then too. And uh, the, you know, the dorm room or take advantage to my... It helps me in sleep. Can you repeat that because I lost you for a couple of seconds? Oh, sorry. I was saying I was in college back then when uh, when you were just thinking about how many bitcoins I could have mined on my computer, you know, with free power from the university, and I didn't. It it's me. Oh yeah, uh, I could just buy one bitcoin. It wasn't much of a big deal back in 2014 when I first heard about it. I could just spend right. 100 bucks and buy one. But I had no you, knowledge about how to hold it and how to run a wallet, how to run a node. I guess I hey, could, you could have bought um, you could have bought 6.6.15 Bitcoin. That would have been even better. Well, yeah. <laughs> but even then I couldn't afford it. I mean, I had a scholarship. It was about eighty dollars a month, and with that, I could basically buy food for a month. <laughs> in some, in some ways, I got lucky because I got out of university um, right at the end of two thousand fourteen, and so I started a business right away, and my business was very successful right off the bat. Uh, so during 2015, I had a lot of time to accumulate. And it was right around the time I found out Bitcoin anyway. So I, you know, just taking money from my business and just plugging it all into Bitcoin. And my wife was like, what are you wasting all our money on? And I was like, shut woman. I'll tell you when we're rich. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing. So did you tell her? Uh, no, I keep her in the dark. No, yeah, yeah, she knows. She knows. She still doesn't care at all. Zero percent. And she only has maybe a vague understanding of how to get to the Bitcoins. So you can feel free to kidnap her. She's not going to be able to tell you anything. Why would I do that? <laughs> well, I don't mean you, Vlad. I mean, any, any audience members who may be listening who are nefarious. You're basically issuing a challenge with a honeypot. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then in America, we have what's called an assault rifle. And I will straight up fucking murder you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's take another question from the audience. <laughs> sure thing. So Hadlo Nod wants to know why you stacked 2 million sats and not 3 million sats. 
Probably because I stacked three million sats the day before. Uh, I just, you know, what, that's another regret I had in 2015. I took my, I took my foot off the gas and I, you know, I got to a number of Bitcoin, um, that I thought was a big number. And then I just basically stopped stacking. And in retrospect, that was a huge mistake. Okay. What was the price of Bitcoin around the time? That was, um, 220. It was like around 220, 220 for like most of 2015. Uh, I feel so bad right now. <laughs> Why were you not, were you not in back then? No, I wasn't. I was still in university until 2016. And I was doing scholarships and basically trying to become an academic, which I wanted at some point. I'm still right. doing a PhD, but I'm not sure when I will finish it because Honestly, I have to choose between something which is a scientific hobby and an intellectual curiosity of mine for which I have to write yeah. an expensive thesis, or I can work on something which actually makes me stack some sats. So what would you choose? Oh, I would 100% stack sats, 100%. Uh, 150% stack sats. I'm, t I'm telling you, when I, in 2015, that was one of the worst mistakes of my life, was not continuing to stack. It was so fucking cheap. It was crazy. And so I got to 100 Bitcoin, which was my number at the time. Probably shouldn't say that, but whatever. I just said it. Um, <laughs> and once I got to 100, I was like, well, that's a very, that's a good number of Bitcoin in case this thing, you know, really takes off. And uh, it is. It definitely is. But I could have had way more if I had just put my foot on the gas. So during this bear market, I just went crazy uh, and bought a shitload more. And then I just kept stacking as hard as I fucking can. And every day I buy three or $400 worth of Bitcoin because I'm not going to get, I, you know, I might, I, I might buy three or $400 of, of Bitcoin every day for the rest of my life because I'm not going to never, I'm, I'm never going to not stack again. That was a mistake. So do you have any kind of long-term plans with your Bitcoins, like passing on legacy, making your children inherit? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I like, I like the freedom that money brings, you know, I have money now and I just feel like I don't have to worry about money as often. I feel like if I want to do something, I can do it. I like the security it comes with the things that you can buy with money, I don't really give a shit about. Like, I don't really need a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Um, you know, a nice house is always nice, but it's not a necessity to live in a mansion. In terms of inheritance, you have to always be very careful with your children uh, so that they don't think that money is free and comes from nothing. You need to, I think my basic thing with my children is going to be you know, if you do the right things, it will be rewarded. So, you know, dad will help you out if you're doing things correctly. If you're doing things incorrectly, I'm not going to punish you, but you're also not going to receive any help. There, you know, there won't be any money coming your way. Um, I, I would like to see my, my Bitcoins go to things that, you know, enhance our future as a species. Uh, be that space travel, be that arts patronage, be that you know, new companies that I invest in and start, whatever it is, I just want to make a mark. Having a legacy doesn't matter as much because who gives a shit? You know, most people don't know who the fuck you are right now while you're alive. 99.999% of the people have no idea who the fuck you are. So the, the fact that, you know, people have this idea that like, I want them all to know who I am after I'm dead. They don't even know who you are right now. They're not going to know who you are after you're dead. Right? So I think a legacy is kind of not a worthy goal to shoot for, but, you know, adding a contribution, adding a brick uh, to the wall of humanity, that is something to shoot for. And if people want to say that's a legacy, that's fine, but you shouldn't care about the praise. You should care about the achievement. Well, you have the legacy of the 615. That's right. 6.15. That's the King's number, the golden number for the big titty bitches. <laughs> <laughs> That's another reason I don't care about my account. You know, my account keeps getting deleted, suspended, whatever. I don't give a shit about this account. By the way, I might as well do this on the pod right now. 
if you guys want to know how to evade a Twitter ban, I'll teach you. What you do is you get a VPN, you log in through a VPN, you get a new, a fresh email account, and you switch your phone number. Bada bing, bada boom, you've evaded Twitter censorship. It's very easy. Really? Yeah. Why? That's all, that's all you do. I, the reason I keep coming back so fast is I keep a second phone line. I switch the number on it. So every time Twitter deletes me, I call up my phone company and I say, hey, what's up? I want a new number. And then I switch the number. Oh, so you can get a new phone number just like that from the phone? Yeah, it, it, costs, it costs $30, but it's pretty easy. Does that not affect the way you get contacted by people? This is my second line um, that I, it's sort of like a burner phone for me. I only use it to do things that are uh, where I need enhanced privacy. Oh, I get it. Right. But if you want to do the cheapo version of this, here's what you do. Text a friend <laughs> who doesn't use Twitter and just be like, hey, bro. I need the code that Twitter just sent you. <laughs> so just put in their phone number and then have them send you back the code when Twitter verifies it via two-factor. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> you're basically giving them access to your account because they can retrieve the password. Well, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to have to do that anyway if you're on Twitter, you know. I mean, I... Oh, you're saying, oh, you're saying the friend, the friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, just do it with people you trust or just don't be cheap and buy yourself a new phone number or just don't get banned off Twitter. But if you don't want to get banned, you're going to have to play by their rules. And, uh, I don't like playing by their rules. So I'm going to keep getting banned. I got banned once about a year ago. Yeah, I did you? I got reported by the Bitcoin cash community. <laughs> oh, I remember that. I remember when you got banned. That's right. Because that's how I became aware of you. It was during your banning. Really? Yeah, because everybody was talking about the Bitcoin Cash people had attacked you. And uh, that, was when I, that was when I was like, oh, who's this guy that they attacked? If, if they attacked him, I must like him. You know? I don't remember it being such a big topic. Uh, I think it was just like scattered around Twitter. It wasn't like, a, it wasn't like the hodl knot thing where it was like a big deal. But I definitely remember hearing about it. And I think that's how I became aware of you. Right. So Jacob wants to know your background and how you became financially free outside of Bitcoin. So, uh, yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. And you were basically asking me how to, because I, you know, I go online, I like brag about my income and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you were asking me how to get, how to get your fiat up so you can get your sats up basically. And um, the way to do it is just have equity in whatever you're doing. So, you know, selling your time for, you know, pieces of paper that are infinitely inflatable, probably not going to be the key to wealth generation, you know, but having equity and sort of, sort of wealth building machine, some sort of an economic machine that continues to make money, you know, you're the owner of the output of that machine or part owner, that's going to be the thing that gets you to a more prosperous place. So for me, I did this, uh, you know, via my production company and, I, you know, you just start when you're young and you get out of school, what you got to do is just start cold emailing people and start calling people and, you know, just don't be afraid to ask for money. So just say, Hey, we're a production company or we're an X company. We do this or that. And then when they say, what's the price be like, it's a hundred thousand dollars. And a lot of people are going to tell you no, but there's going to be two people that tell you yes. And then you just made $200,000, right? So it's kind of like, it's kind of like going up to supermodels and asking them if they want to bang you, right? <laughs> Most of them are going to say no, but maybe there's a couple who are like, hey, all right, I'm feeling lonely today. That's a good metaphor, I guess. <laughs> Never tried to put on supermodels, always felt like they're out of my league. No, fuck that, Vlad. You go right up to them and you'd be like, my name is Vlad. I'm going to fuck the shit out of you. Okay, I do it better than anybody else. And then you see what they say. It depends. In this <laughs> Me Too culture, probably I'm going to get reported on social media or something. Get called out. 
whatever. <laughs> well, that's the, the key to wealth generation, though, is overcoming those hurdles in your mind, those psychological hurdles. Because it's, it's, you know, it's hard to ask somebody for 100,000, 10,000, 50,000, whatever it is, whatever the number is. It's hard to, to, you know, feel like you're worth that money, especially when you're just starting out. But you got to kind of just fake it till you make it. And uh, you get your paper up, son, you know? Right. Um, Sasquatch Muscle wants to know your thoughts on CoinJoin and privacy in general. Right. Yeah. I was talking in, uh, on, about this a little bit on Twitter. I'm nervous about doing coin joins, and I so I haven't done any myself. I kind of follow um, <laughs> Shinobi and Mr. Hoddle when they go back and forth about privacy. And I think one of them is Team Wasabi and one of them is Team Samurai, although I can't remember which is which. One of the things about privacy that's hard is if you make a single mistake, it basically ruins your privacy, right? And so every time I start to go down the privacy rabbit hole, I start to just get more and more overwhelmed and confused. And I, I guess I'm in the camp with those that are waiting for it to become easier, basically. I don't think it's hard if you download Wasabi. It's very straightforward. The interface is one of the most elegant I have seen in any Bitcoin wallet ever. That's, that's good to know. Here's the thing, though. Can't you just get a lot of the same benefit that you can by doing a coin join, by, by just sending your coins to an exchange and then getting them back out of the same exchange? No. I thought you could, because that basically breaks chain analysis also. Awesome. The, the, only pro, the only problem being that you have, the, you have the exchange knows your information, right? But with Wasabi, you're basically mixing your coins with 50 other pe people. Right. It's hard for anyone to tell where comes from which part. You're basically I also, any link to previous transactions. I also have a problem with these privacy discussions because nobody's going to fucking do this. You know, like most normal people are not going to do this. I mean, I'm a pretty hardcore Bitcoiner and even I don't want to do it. So, you know, if, if, if you just have privacy for one person or, you know, a, a small subset of people, you don't really have that much privacy. It kind of needs to be for everybody, right? So I, I don't know that we've quite cracked privacy or fungibility in any sort of meaningful way. And I, it doesn't seem to me like CoinJoin is, is the, the way that we're going to crack it. Now, maybe if, you know, once, uh, you know, what is it, Taproot that allows CoinJoin by default, maybe once that happens, that'll be a different, you know, totally different ballgame. But right now where we're at, I don't quite see it taking off. I think Taproot is about smart contract functionality. Oh, that's right. It's Schnorr, it's Schnorr that allows CoinJoin by default, right? Mm, Schnorr is kind of different. Well, yeah, it might integrate CoinJoins, but I think the discussion was about confidential transactions. Which right. Is well, Schnorr is just a, a more elegant signature scheme, but my understanding like see this is the thing i'm not technical so my understanding is uh is less than others which is why you shouldn't listen to me about any of this <laughs> go listen to other people but at least you have 615 bitcoins that's 6.15 yeah or as matt odell keeps admonishing me 615 million sats ah doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> it doesn't does it <laughs> Uh, I, I fucked up already. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, I don't, I don't know much about privacy. I know enough to be trepidatious about it. But don't you worry ever that you might be receiving coins that are tainted and linked to the Silk Road? I don't worry about tainted coins, do you? Sometimes. Because I, I think if that becomes a thing, that there are actually, quote unquote, tainted coins, then the entire thing is done, like Bitcoin's over. We can't have different classifications for coins, you know? But there are different classifications and chainalysis. Well, it's like yeah, there, which coins are, right. which ones come from dubious sources. 
Right. I'm, I'm talking about in the marketplace, not technically. So if there are, you know, if there's like a separate market for untainted coins, then there is for tainted coins, which I guess you could say it always gets so complicated. I guess you could say there is with the OTC desk. But if that ever became a you know global thing, I think we're in a dangerous place. And there's the argument that it would get arbitraged away anyway, because, OK, who's to say you think this coin is tainted? I don't give a shit. It's still a Bitcoin. I'll take it off your hands. It's still digi as digitally scarce as the next Bitcoin, right? So I think that would maybe kill the market for quote unquote tainted or untainted coins. I don't like the terminology though. I don't, like I wouldn't say there's tainted coins. There are coins that have been on Silk Road, sure. But, you know, are those tainted? I don't think they belong to the people who use them on Silk Road anymore. Right. It's like, is there tainted cash? You know, something like, what, what is it? Something like 20% of all cash has cocaine on it. Or maybe it's like 80% of all cash has cocaine on it. Is that tainted cash? No. No, because it's cash. You can physically hold it and nobody can take it away from you. But if you do the same with your bank account and you basically use digital money, which is issued by your bank, they're going to look for the source. And it's interesting, and I had this conversation with a friend today, and she basically told me that her bank account is frozen and she cannot receive her pay. And she has been working hard for the past months and wants to get her salary and she mm. cannot get it because of her bank account. And I basically told her, this is the new slavery. Right. You have a bank account, and without it, if the bank arbitrarily decides that you're not eligible to have one for whatever reason, then you will not be able to get engaged in the economy. You lose part of your financial rights. Well, totally. Yeah. But this is, this is what I'm saying is we don't have that construct in Bitcoin. Nobody can freeze your account. You know, I mean, if you're using a trusted third party, sure. But if you're taking control of your own monetary sovereignty, nobody's going to be able to freeze you. That's why Bitcoin matters. And that's why we should... Right cash and we should not allow our governments to push us towards that cashless society which maybe that they have in sweden yeah i think you know there's some sort of idea kicking around in my head that i've never fully fleshed out but you know at some point the governments are definitely going to try and go cashless like i think we have to see that coming right we all do um and the question is, do they do it with some sort of blockchain type technology um, that's Bitcoin adjacent? And if so, does that speed up the velocity of their own demise? You know? Not really, because people don't care. I mean, we right. haven't seen the consequences yet, and they're not aware what it's like to have your money basically controlled by a third party that can do anything with it and can tell you when you cannot spend it. And we can already see how some banks don't allow you to buy Bitcoins. They will just stop any transaction which takes place in any kind of Bitcoin exchange. They basically blacklisted, for example, Coinbase, and you cannot make any purchases. And it's your money. Why do they care? They're going to say it's right. protection that they have for you. When it's also like, you know, you using your money to, let's say, fund terrorism or uh, commit murder or whatever it is, the, the funding it is not a crime. The doing of the terrorism or the murder or the, you know, illegal drug trade, that's the crime, right? Which I don't think illegal drugs should be uh, criminally penalized, but... That's the crime. And they're, they don't want to do old fashioned police work where they solve the crime. They want to. Hello. I think I lost you. I don't hear you anymore. Uh, I'm not sure if you're <laughs> connected. Me? Yeah, you're back. You got me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should I start over on what I was saying, or should we just continue on? Start over, please. I, I think what I was saying is basically, the, um, so basically, you know, funding.
lost you again. I usually don't edit podcasts, but this one is going to need it because of these breaks. Hey, hey Vlad. I hear you now. You hear me now again? Yeah. Not sure what's going on. My whole app just glitched out. I think it's on my end. Oh, you use the phone app? No, I'm on the iPad, um, but it glitched out on me. Okay. It's still... Great. All right. I'll start. I'll start over. So what I was... So basically, doing a crime is the crime. Funding the crime is not the crime. And they don't want to do good old-fashioned police work where they track down the criminals. They just want to track all of us all the time and see where our money is going, you know? Well, I guess that depends. If you're dealing with a known criminal and you're basically encouraging it by knowing what you're doing, then I guess you hold part of the guilt or whatever has been done because you knew where, what your money was going to do. But in some cases, you unknowingly donate to some kind of charity and they turn out to be some sort of Charles Manson cult. Right. Well, but if you were if you were donating, let's say you were using, you know, sending money to some sort of criminal or, or whatever, uh, the service that you're procuring, the criminal service, that's the crime. The sending of the money is not a crime. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah and they've made they've made the sending of money a crime. Like the OFAC list is a you know a terrorism watch list where they won't allow you to uh, you know now another thing people get confused on this point where they think that you know because we have addresses in Bitcoin that these addresses are easily censorable, um, but you know sure <laughs> you can just start it you can just create a new address you can create as many addresses as you want so go ahead and censor them it doesn't matter. Also with that and the fact that it's an open market and if somebody refuses, like a miner blocks you and doesn't want to transact with you, there's going to right. be one which wants to collect your fees. That's exactly, that's the other thing. In the case of something which is centralized and has a central power, which basically decides all of you are not going to do this and you're not going to accept money or send money to this third party, well, in the case of Bitcoin, there's going to be somebody on the open market. For example, I can think of full mempools and I can think of miners that basically take advantage of full mempools and they say, okay, I'm going to pick up these transactions, which are the cheapest because there are so many of them and I'm going to make some money. And that's fair, right? Mm -hmm. it's economic right as a miner to basically do a service or which you're going to get paid. Yeah, I agree. Such concept with banks. There's not going to be one which is fair with you because they have to comply to the same rules and regulations. There are going right. to be ones that are more Orwellian and harsher and want to check on every cent or penny that you're sending to other people. They're going to be curious about the source and the purpose. And there are going to be people who don't care. And they're going to be blinded by this whole movement of saying, I have nothing to hide, so I don't care. And their ignorance is going to basically punish people who maybe need the privacy for reasons that are not necessarily criminal in any sense. I think in... Um... I think in Bitcoin, you know, we we sometimes unfairly get accused of attacking uh, the the quote unquote Bitcoin banks, you know, the exchanges like Coinbase or, or Kraken or Gemini or any of those. Um, and we do we do attack them, and we the reason we attack them is because they are subject to all of the same regulations that the modern banking system is subject to. So they censor transactions and they act just like just like any other bank. Right. So we may see a world in which once enough people have taken control of their monetary sovereignty and we've broken, uh, you know, sort of the global you know, monopoly on on banking, we can see a more free market banking system arise. And maybe in that free market banking system, you would feel comfortable leaving your Bitcoin with uh, a bank with a good reputation. Maybe not all your Bitcoin, but maybe some of your Bitcoin, you know.
knowing how hard I had to work for the small amounts of Bitcoin that I was able to accumulate, I would never leave it in the hands of somebody else. Totally. Yeah, no, I feel that I feel that way right now, too. Um, but maybe in 100 years, it's different. You know, I'm, this is a very long term view I'm taking on this. I guess with every major paradigm shift, there has been something very radical in the sense that they wanted to change everything fundamentally. And you had these early adopters who understood it and got it. And then you had people who just wanted to adapt it to their old way of living so that they preserve whatever they knew and whichever way of life they had. Right. And right now I can see it, for example, with, I'm not sure if you saw that product, the coin mine. Oh yeah, that Pomp is an investor in. Supposedly, I don't care much about Pomp. I don't listen to his <laughs> podcast. I don't follow him. I don't like the style in which he tweets. I don't see the value that he brings into the space, but that's just a subjective point of view that I have. But the product itself is mediocre. And people just seem to like it because supposedly it's very quiet and doesn't make much noise. So you can keep it in your living room. But it's not going to mine anything. It has such a low hash rate. And it's kind of pointless. It, it runs a full node, which is nice. I guess that's admirable. It can do lightning better than, than the Casa node, which is just underpowered. And it's not going to work so well. But it's $700. For that kind of money, you can buy either an ASIC which is about 200 bucks on eBay. Or you can buy an Xbox One X, which is much more powerful. And you've, if you have any kind of coding skills, you can basically tweak that machine to mine more Bitcoins than the coin mine for almost half of the price. When you look at the, the people that the coin mine is being targeted to, you know, I get ads for the coin mine on Facebook videos all the time. Um, and so they're targeting to a very, um, I don't want to say low level, but low level consumer. I get it. And there's a market for that. But what I'm saying is that their product is too expensive for what it does. Right. I can understand that they make a profit out of it. But after that, they're going to tax 5% of all the coins that you mine. And they say it's just for updates to your system but they already made a profit so if apple did this i guess a lot of people would be enraged if they took five percent of what you have earned with your iphone let's say that they have this type of system which monitors how much money you're making with your phone and then they decide to take five percent and say they're going to improve the service you already paid a lot of money for the product and they're making a profit out of it if you got a nice deal, like the whole system was 200 bucks, and that's how much the hardware is and they're not making any profit, then you can say, okay, this is fair because I'm going to pay for the rest of what, for the labor and for the software and for the rest of the hard work. I'm going to pay it by plugging in the machine and basically giving away 5% of all the Bitcoins that I mine. But when you pay $700 or $800, it's not fair in any way. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it feels like um, if, Net, if Netflix was to give you ads, you know, it's like, no, I already pay for this. I don't, I don't want ads in the middle of it. Exactly. Or yeah. just, I'm not sure if you have a Nintendo Switch. I don't know, but I do have an Xbox One X. There's Doom, like the original game from 1993, which was launched on Nintendo Switch. Right. You basically had to pay five bucks for it, which is a very reasonable price. But yeah. after you paid five bucks, they would make you create this kind of Bethesda account. And that would basically verify the integrity of the files and keep some metrics, like collect statistics about how you play and how long how much time you spend within the game. And that's the kind of stuff that you expect from free software. You download this shitty app from the app store. Right, right. 
free. They're going to collect data about you, but that's the way they monetize. When you pay money for it, you expect it to be, you know, yours and you should be able to do whatever you want to do with it. Well, further, <laughs> what's even more bullshit is that I know for a fact that Doom has been open source for 20 years, you know? I think the engine has. I'm not sure. Yeah, which is fucking, that's insane. Like, that's, that's crazy, you know? It is, and it, it's an incredible video game. I can't think of anything from the era which is just as great. Oh, I love Doom. You know, there was uh, John Cormack, who's the uh, creator, um, was just on the Joe Rogan podcast the other day. Very, very worth listening to if you haven't checked it out yet. I'm going to listen to it while I work. I know that yeah, it's, he's a he, smart guy. Super, super smart. And what I didn't know about him was that he had a rocket company um, that was somewhat competing with uh, SpaceX for a while. Yeah, they got grants from NASA. They won some companies. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't keep up with his company at all. I didn't, I didn't even know about that. So very interesting. He's kind of a psycho. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin, yeah. I have no idea why he is, and he is not into Bitcoin. Possibly he's For- too busy working on Facebook's Oculus Rift. Well, probably because he's already rich, too, you know. I mean, once you're already rich, <laughs> you know, you don't care about money as, as much. Well, I can think of the Winklevi and who else is very rich. I think Trace Mayer was already rich when he got into Bitcoin. Yeah, but there's a big difference between, you know, a couple million bucks and you know, hundreds of millions, billions, you know. Like, I think, I think Trace and Roger, those guys, Eric Voorhees, they, they probably were all worth, like, you know, a couple million bucks when they first got in. And now a lot of them are billionaires or, or knocking on the door of being billionaires. Right. I don't think John Cormack is quite that rich, but I bet you he has 50 million bucks, 100 million bucks. Possibly, and he's a geek, the kind of guy who's right. a lot of time just obsessing about whatever he does. It's like Steve Wozniak. You remember when Steve Wozniak said he sold his Bitcoin because he didn't like watching the price go up and down? Yeah. <laughs> he was checking the price too much and he was like, I don't like it. <laughs> you know? But at least he's old and possibly he doesn't care much. To him, it's all experimental. Well, at a certain point, too, you know, you are being, it is sort of an insanity um, to continue to acquire capital. Uh, actively like like if you already built those wealth machines in your youth and then they continue to work for you that's great but if you spend all your time thinking about and fantasizing about money instead of living uh, then that's not really that's not really life you've kind of just made money your god and that's your your fixed focal point oh I agree a lot of people don't seem to get this but I suppose those who don't are the ones who are not really rich and have never held like a fabulous amount of money or Bitcoins in their wallets. Right. Because that's, well, t- I'll, t- I'll tell you, man, like I'm, I'm rich, uh, you know, by any standard, you know, my, my, my net worth in, uh, you know, USD is like $6 million. So I have money and, uh, I don't feel any different. I feel the same money took care of some of my money problems, but, it didn't make me feel different as a, as a person. And I think where we all get tripped up as humans is like, let's say you're out in the cold and you're starving and you're hungry and you're wet. Uh, and somebody brings you into a nice warm house and they give you food and they give you a blanket and they let you warm up by the fire. Well, you went from misery to happiness and it was stuff that made the difference. Things made you happy. Because you had a lack of things and, and then you had things around you and, and that made you happy. And that's, that's, a true, that's a truth about humanity. The lie uh, that we all tell ourselves is that if I had that many more things, I would be that much more happy. And somebody like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, they must walk around in this perpetual state of bliss. And that's not reality. Once you get to a basic level of uh, sustenance, Nothing else will make you much happier from there. Makes a lot of sense. 
I guess um, maybe they'll never be rich, like you are, or like Roger Veer, Eric Borges, and Trace Mayer. But uh, at least maybe I get to live a decent life in which I don't have to worry much about surviving because right. I, the biggest struggle of them all, being able to put food on the table, being able to raise a family and basically live a normal life that's void of existential struggles. And I don't mean psychological existential struggles. I mean, something which basically threatens your health directly. Right. But I, I, well, I think, I think if you, you know, if you have enough Bitcoin, you're not going to necessarily be rich, but it's going to, it's going to be very good for you. Now the hard part will come. What's your long-term plan? You know, what do you, you're only 27. So What's 50 years from now look like for Vlad? Because you have to make those decisions now. You know, people think that you can make them later. You can't. You're going to win or lose later based on the decisions you make now. It's like safety and thing where you're trading with future Vlad, right? So during the next bull run, if the Bitcoin price is half a million dollars uh, or something crazy like that, what does present Vlad do? How does he trade against future Vlad? Does present Vlad go out and spend all his Bitcoin on a house and a nice car and a this and a that? Or does President Vlad maybe sell a little Bitcoin or spend a little to fund some needs and some wants, but maintains a large chunk for future Vlad and future generations? These are very, you know, it's a very personal question too. Like, I can't tell you what's right for you. Um, only you can tell you what's right for you. Oh, yeah. And you said that you never sold any Bitcoins ever. Never. And I, and I, you know what, I, I want to say I never will because I'm going to spend them, you know, on investments that are productive and make me more Bitcoin. Uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll spend a little bit of that to live and things, but I don't, my, my net worth is not entirely Bitcoin. Some of it is in dirty paper currency. <laughs> so I, I just, I tend to spend that instead of spending the Bitcoin. Psychedelic Alberto wants to know when you found out about Bitcoin and how long it took you, for how long you have been a skeptic. Yeah. I, well, I found out about it in 2012 on the Joe Rogan podcast um, from Duncan Trussell, who was talking about people buying drugs on the Silk Road. And I thought, okay, you know, I had the same thought everybody has, which is like, okay, cool. Some nerds are buying drugs with nerd money. Right. <laughs> And then a year later, my, my buddy came to me at the bar and because you know, me and him wanted to buy drugs. And then he was like, hey, dude, you know that Bitcoin thing? It hit $1,300. Because I, I knew that at the time Duncan Trussell talked about it, they were like $12 or something. So I was like, holy shit, that's like a thousand X or a hundred X, a thousand X, a thousand X. And I was like, I could have been, you know, so rich. Um, and then, and then it took me like a year and a half of that basically like depression. Uh, and then I saw the price had cratered, you know, it was in the low 200s. And that was when I decided to finally buy some. And uh, at the time I was buying it, it still kind of basically felt like I was throwing my money away, you know. It's all like that in the beginning. Right. You feel like you could have spent that money on something which could have made you happier. But this is a great lesson. Yeah, exactly. Even though maybe that Bitcoin will get nowhere, assumingly that we're not going to see another bull run. But we have all learned a great lesson about basically tempering our preference and trying to understand what is essential and what is just a pointless materialistic want that we have. Yes. And uh, I think Bitcoin, you know, I was already on that path before Bitcoin. Like I was already ruminating about these things and thinking about delaying gratification. Uh, I didn't call it lowered time preference at that time. I called it delayed gratification. And I, I knew that if I traded with my future self that I could make much more money. Um, 
but Bitcoin hardened that resolve to a tremendous degree. So, you know, all the things I was thinking about, about delaying gratification, I just started taking them to like, you know, extreme conclusions. Like I may never spend any of this Bitcoin. Um, I may just leave it to future generations. You know, we'll have to see. But I, I started thinking of myself less as a person who owned this Bitcoin and more as a steward of this Bitcoin, somebody who's just who just happens to be looking after it. Right. Also have another question and possibly we're going to do them all. But Roxana Nasoy, who is also Romanian, wants to know how many Twitter accounts you're, you predict that you're going to have by 2025? <laughs> by 2025, let's see, I'm averaging four a year. So I've already gone through five. So by 2025, uh, about 26 accounts, I'll say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not as much as you would assume. <laughs> about five a year, not so bad. It's, a, well, it's sort of like it takes me a couple, uh, couple months to go through an account, you know. Also, Walter Shiwaitamoto, which is a nice pun for Walter White, wants to know if your friends and family know that you're Bitcoin rich and if they listen to you to buy some. And oh, my God. Any hyper Bitcoinization plans? My, uh, my friends and family all know that I have Bitcoin. They all know that I won't shut the fuck up about Bitcoin. Um, but none of them, for some reason, believe I'm rich. <laughs> they, just, they just don't believe it, which is strange. Um, <laughs> it's not like I go around screaming, I'm, I'm rich, I'm rich either. But, you know, when money conversations come up or whatever, you know, you say these things to people, like people will tell you things about how they're, they're financing a, a timeshare or something that's a really stupid purchase and, and you'll start to give them advice about it. And they'll, they'll give you some boilerplate explanation that's just kind of like, well, everybody does this, you know? And it's like, yeah, well, if everybody does it, it's, it's not something you should be doing. You shouldn't be doing what everybody else is doing. You know, you shouldn't be financing a car, you know, stuff like that. Um, so no, they don't believe me and they think I'm insane. So American huddle is going against the American dream. That's right. Yeah, I don't believe you should live in uh, up to your eyeballs in debt uh, or, you know, like what's wrong? Why is everybody in such a hurry, man? You know, you're not going to appreciate any of the things that you get if you get them right now. You're going to appreciate them after you've worked for them. You know, you don't need a new car. Like an old shitty car will work and will get you to where you're going. You know, sometimes I go to the, um, you know, I'm a, I live in like a nice area and I go to the store and there's, you know, $150,000 cars parked next to me, uh, Mercedes and Lamborghinis and, you know, this and that. And I just always think to myself, like, we're all here at the same place. We all drove on roads that have speed limits. You didn't get here any faster than I did. So you basically paid $130,000 more than I did just so people would think you were cool when you got to this location. All I had to do was park in the back, you know, and then show up and uh, let my personality do the talking for me. I, th I, think it's, I think it's crazy the way most people live. Oh, some people think they get some kind of eternal riches and big titty bitches if they own Lamborghini. <laughs> but that's not true. No, you have to, we all know that you have to have 6.15 Bitcoin for that. And that's the true, the true status symbol is 6.15 Bitcoin, you know? Exactly. And all you gotta, all you gotta do is sign, sign that transaction at the bar, you know, just sign that transaction at the bar and that she's just gonna, she's gonna take off her top. That's, that's all I know. Wait, so 6.15 Bitcoin and ladies are going to take off their top at the bar. Yeah. You don't, you don't give them the Bitcoin. You just sign a transaction in front of them. They go crazy, dude. They'll, take, they'll just take it all off right there. I've seen it. So you can certify that this is what happens. 
Oh my, yeah, I've done a lot of, you know, me and my team, uh, we've been out there field testing it and we're getting some promising uh, data, some promising feedback. So I'll be publishing a full report uh, in the coming months. This is a very wide survey uh, that we've been doing. But yeah, we've been going to bars across the world and uh, surveying well-endowed women. Mm. Could you please spoil the results and say to which extent or what is the percentage of success? Yeah, it's 100%. I can say that uh, with, with impunity. That's perfect. So who was your <laughs> biggest influence or mentor in the beginning? This is a question by Run the Banks. Uh, in the Bitcoin space? I have no idea what the beginning is. <laughs> yes? You know, um, I'm going to go with a different answer than most people would give. And I'm going to say uh, Peter Thiel. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you've read Peter Thiel's Zero to One. Have you read that book? No. Well, it's, it's probably the best business book of our time. And in it, Peter talks about some really interesting phenomena between the generations. Um, like, for instance, you know, like our grandparents' generation, the generation that fought in World War II, was the type of generation to use, you know, have big, hairy, audacious goals and use calculus to get there. You know, it was like, we're going to the moon. We're going to put a man on the moon. How are we going to do it? I don't know. We're going to do the math. We're going to, we're going to figure it out. And then our parents' generation was this sort of generation of indefinite optimists um, where they were saying, things are probably going to get better in our lifetime. And we're not sure how they're going to get better, but they're going to get better. Um, and, you know, I, I guess this is the sort of algebraic function that, that shows that these things are going to get better. How are they going to happen? I'm not quite sure, right? And then our generation is sort of indefinite to definite pessimistic, where we know that bad things are going to happen uh, and that we're just trying to get out of the way of those bad things. And a lot of people in our generation, you know, use hedonism uh, or... Uh, you know, high time preference activity and behavior to escape this pessimistic fate. Whereas we as Bitcoiners, I think, are reverting to, you know, sort of our grandparents' generation and uh, being becoming definite optimists again, where we're saying the world is going to get better. We know we've done the math. The math is this. Here's how the Bitcoin algorithm works. Here's when the halvings are. You know, the blocks keep propagating. Things are getting better. And we have reason and cause to be optimistic. And uh, I took a lot of influence from that book. I know Peter Thiel owned Bitcoin and, and sold it. Uh, I'm sure he will own it again. He's a very smart guy, other than his investment in EOS, which uh, makes me lose a little bit of respect for him. But he's still a super genius who I, I definitely respect. He also has this thing where, you know, in Silicon Valley, they say that, uh, you know, everything's, you know, failure is, is like pre-success. Like, oh, we didn't fail. We're, we're just pre-successful. And Peter's take on that whole thing is, you know, failure is not some sort of Darwinian imperative where there's a lot of um, tragedy, but it's beautiful and you learn something. You know, P Peter thinks failure is always tragic and avoidable. And uh, that's also a lesson I always like to employ, to not think that I'm going to fail when I start out, to start out with a clear goal in mind and to do anything that it takes to hit that goal. Fascinating. But do you have anybody from the Bitcoin space? And I <laughs> was invested in Bitcoin, but somebody like, I don't know, Adam Back, Nick Sabo, Al Finney, Obviously, obviously, Nick Zabo is uh, incredibly you know, intelligent and his writings, a lot of them I have to read four or five times because they go over my head. Uh, you know what? I like how, you know, I always liked Hal when I found out about Hal because Hal was just like perma bullish from day one. Like Hal was just like, of course, it's going to be the world reserve currency. Like this was at a time when, you know, this was just on some obscure mailing list. Uh, that Hal and 25 other people were subscribed to and Hal was the only one who wrote back. But he just had this like eternal optimism. 
and he he saw the vision from day one. So yeah, that's pretty inspiring. And then also, you know, in the early days, Andreas was very inspiring to me. And uh, now I don't like him as much. Do you think that he has changed or you have changed? I, you know, I think I've changed. Um, I also don't agree with his assessment that maximalism is a fear response. I think Andreas has to think that because he's been on the brunt receiving end of a lot of maximalist attacks uh, recently. And so he thinks that it's a, it's a fear response and that we're all afraid of losing our money. And I think it's more of a moral response to all the scamming that's been going on in this open system. Like people, people like to, people like to use the free market to explain away um, their immoral behavior. And it's like, well, it's all the free market, man. Well, hey, me telling you that you're an immoral piece of shit, that's the free market too. And I can print articles about it that say you're an immoral piece of shit and I can attack you as much as I want because that's also the free market. So if we're all going to stand behind the free market, letting us do whatever we want, well, what I want to do is impede your ability to do whatever you want to do. And that's also the free market. Well, sure. But at the same time, there is a point where we just have to accept that we're dealing with grown-ups who are stubborn. And no matter what we're going to tell them, they're going to be convinced that they might be right and they want to prove us wrong just out of spite or just because they have this kind of feeling that they want to be on top and they want to prove you wrong. And there's nothing right. to these people. You can try to educate them. You can try to explain to them rationally what's going on, but they're going to see that B cash is a lot better and big blocks are a good idea and whatever. Well, those, that's, those people are, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, those are people that are stupid who don't know they're stupid. Like, I don't care about them. I, wh who I care about are the people that are, that should know better, you know. And uh, I think Andrea should know better. That's my own personal opinion. He's obviously free to do whatever he wants. And he always blocks me on Twitter, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Anyway, my, my opinion isn't going to get through to him. At least you're getting a new account, which means that you get a first... I, that's right. I get, I get a fresh block. I get to get blocked again. And he gets to evaluate your opinions once again. So maybe I also think you will be friends with him. What I was saying earlier about people pr promoting dangerous and false narratives, you know, Andreas was doing a lot of that uh, back in the 2013, 14, 15 era. And he promoted a lot of falsehoods uh, or a lot of things that were myopic that were true at the time that later turned out to be false. And, you know, it's hard to fully fault him for that, but there was collateral damage from some of that that he did. So, Like when he was saying that Bitcoin is free to transact? Right, yeah. He was, and he would make that a point at all of his. And, you know, he was technically kind of right at the time. I mean, it was, it was never free, but it was very cheap. Um, I don't know. I wish, obviously, I wish he'd had a little more foresight or at least, you know, it, some atonement would be nice from him. I've seen nothing from him that is, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said all that. Nothing. Yeah, he doesn't seem very humble in this regard. He would No, he also seems, hard. yeah, he seems like, he seems like he has newfound fame and uh, he's intent to keep his newfound fame. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm suspicious of anybody who, wants to put their face out in public like that, you know, especially that's me as an anonymous Bitcoiner. Part of the reason for being anonymous is, you know, because I kind of am like this in real life. Like, I don't need uh, to be anonymous to say the word faggot. Like, I'll say faggot on Facebook. I don't care. But <laughs> the reason I want to be anonymous is because I don't matter. I'm a nobody. I'm just some guy, you know. So when you put your face out there, like Andreas does so publicly and he's all over the place, And I know that you're, I know that you're a public Bitcoiner too, but you know, some of these people are really seeking the limelight and um, I'm always immediately distrustful of that behavior. Yeah, I can see why, because I tend to be the same with people who just want fame for the sake of it and don't want to do anything right. 
too. But in the case of Andreas, at least he's writing books and I know that he is working on mastering Lightning Network. Yeah, I'll have to put that one on my shelf next to Mastering Ethereum. Oh, you bought Mastering Ethereum? <laughs> no, I'm ki- no, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I, would nev- I would never buy Mastering Ethereum. What's to master? There is a lot to master, but it's a mess. <laughs> Well, that's that's what I'm saying is you know they're they're going in a million different directions at once uh, and none of them are going to work out so it's it's just a complex Rube Goldberg machine you know what I mean you know what a Rube Goldberg machine is no <laughs> those are those things where like you know the the guy will be eating breakfast and in order to get the eggs on the plate this complex contraption around him. Uh, you know, <laughs> moves a bunch of levers and then puts the eggs on the plate. Have you ever seen those videos on YouTube or anything? No. Never? I'll have to send you one. But anyway, it's it's unnecessary bullshit is what it is. So making an extra effort to do something which is obvious? Yes. Simple just as is? Yes. Yeah, I can agree with that. And I used to be very enthusiastic about Ethereum because it was using all the hype words that I was willing to ingurgitate right. at the time. The world computer, decentralized internet with decentralized applications that can be deployed and cannot be censored. And in my mind, I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the future. This is the kind of invention which I was waiting for. But no. Well, this this was, uh, I had the, I had a, dissimilar reaction where when Ethereum first launched, I mean, I was there for the Ethereum ICO and I could have invested, uh, you know, at Ethereum at 50 cents, which I guess in retrospect I should have done, but you know, nothing made any sense. And you'd ask Vitalik questions and he would come back with nonsense and then his disciples would spew more nonsense and none of it ever seemed like it had any chance of succeeding. And then it grew to, you know, $1,100 a a coin, which is something I never saw coming because I never thought the fucking thing made sense. I never had an aha moment with Ethereum. Did you? In a what? An an aha moment. You know, that moment where you look at it and you go, aha, this is it. Eureka moment. Yes, Eureka moment. No, not really. Yeah, nobody does. It doesn't make sense. And I used to, you know, I used to go on their, on our Ethereum, uh, on their Reddit, and I would ask a bunch of questions. I mean, all the time. Like, I spent a lot of time on r-Ethereum trying to figure out if, if something was real. And I never got back any answers that made any sense. And I still haven't. The whole thing doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like, wh- how are they going to go, how are they going to transition their system to proof of stake? It doesn't seem like it's it's feasible in any way, shape, or form, right? <laughs> it it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to happen. And then all the stuff that they said, you know, the world computer and decentralized that they've abandoned all of it for these new narratives that aren't that also don't make sense. Like DeFi, so like, right? Like DeFi, or now they're a quote unquote programmable store of value. No, they're not. They're at the drop of a hat, they can uh, change the, you know, the monetary code base. Like nobody knows how many Ethereum are going to be issued. There are no uh, guarantees. It's it's a soft money system. Um, yeah, it's it's nuts to me. They have a they have a quote unquote Linus Torval, but like, you know, Linus Torval, you know, who leads Linux, is a genius and he's humble and he knows what he's doing. Vitalik doesn't seem to be any of those things. Yeah, but I guess Vitalik gets too much credit for Ethereum. While it wasn't his invention 100%, maybe he came up right. with it and did some basic coding, but he had people working and doing the hard work while he was that's, doing that, Yeah, that's true. I mean, he also had Charles Hoskinson and some other people Maybe that Charles Hoskinson is not the best example, but he's a coder at core. 
you know, there's, you know, I don't know how many people know about this, but you know, Andreas owns at least a million dollars worth of Ethereum. Really? Uh, yeah. Do you know that? No. There was a pod podcast back. I think it was on the the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast back in 2015, and he talks about buying, um, you know, a thousand Ethereum at at the uh, ICO. So at the top, that was a million dollars worth of Ethereum. Um, so it, it totally makes sense where his economic incentives were aligned, you know, and that's why he wrote that book and continues to shill for Ethereum. But yeah, he invested in the ICO. He was there for it. Possibly. A lot of Bitcoiners got in around the time. Oh, no, I know. I know. It was promoted as Bitcoin 2.0. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, today he still has minimum quarter million dollars worth of Ethereum. Although I'm sure he has more. Yeah, makes no sense, really. I mean, nah. Bitcoin, you can see that there's a future for it. There's an application for it, and there is a demand in this crazy world where transactions get censored and banks get too much control. So there's a use case, which is clear. In the case of Ethereum, you can argue that decentralized applications have value. You can say something like this decentralized exchange can be interesting and can be something with which we can make experiments. But more than that, what can you use really? Like colored, colored coins that they're trying to build on top of Bitcoin right now? Right. With tokens and collectibles. You had crypto yep. that basically destroyed the whole scalability of Ethereum around the time. People don't even know that um, that's that colored coins is a, is a Bitcoin concept. You know, like all of these things, all of these Ethereum things were things that we used to talk about in the Bitcoin forums uh, before Ethereum launched. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all of their concepts came from Bitcoin, like for the most part. I don't know about some of that, some of the new crap, but a lot of the things that were working or uh, were proposed were originally, you know, just stuff that was part of the Bitcoin community. And uh, it didn't get implemented for a variety of reasons, Ma namely that none of it really ever worked, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and also it was questionable to which extent Bitcoin was scalable to do all that crazy shit. Right. Yeah, when it's expensive to do things on top of Bitcoin because your idea has to actually have uh, economic merit and value because the chain is expensive. So if you're going to put things on top of Bitcoin, then you better, you know, be making more money than you're, you're spending in transaction costs. So Brady at Citizen Bitcoin and Mr. Poopy Bitcoin wants to know, how did you become such a badass and also What's it like to be a toxic badass every day when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> uh, you know what? I just, I have never given a fuck what other people think. And uh, I still don't. And that's, that, that's where it all comes from. So that's what badass means. I, I guess. I guess I'm just, I'm just not afraid to say the thing that other people are thinking uh, but possibly not saying. You're, you're maybe, like Dieter, maybe Dieter Bob. Dieter Bob is thinking them, but maybe other people are not. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> Shout out there. <laughs> I hope he listens. Oh, I bet he does. Is he a fan? I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. D Dieter's insane, though. Like, insane. I mean, I like him sometimes. <laughs> I like him, too. But he goes after me almost, you know, he goes after everybody. Like, for no reason, a lot of the time. <laughs> and he'll take, like, a whiff of shit coinery, just a whiff, and turn it into a, he'll build a mountain out of a molehill, you know, and, and make it a full-blown uh, federal case <laughs> where he's, He's all up your ass. Like if you said if you said the technology behind ZK Snarks looked interesting, he would be all up your ass and be like, "You fucking shit coiner!" You know? Oh, I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of which is it's hilarious.
and he has that avatar of a small dog. The... <laughs> right, small small attack dog. So who is the most toxic member of Bitcoin Twitter? This is a question by MF Huddle. Well, oh, that's Dieter for sure. So he is the most toxic. Yeah, 100%. We just have like three more questions. When, <laughs> when will you build your first Bitcoin-based business? This is from Professor Hash. Right, yeah, this is going to be called the the 6.15 Club, and it's going to be for gentlemen of leisure and uh, big titty bitches that accompany them into the club. So how does that function as a business? Well, you're gonna have what you're going to have to do is sign a transaction showing that you have 6.15 Bitcoin, and uh, or you're going to have to show up at the front door with huge tits, and those are the two ways in. So how are you going to make money out of this? Oh, it's not, uh, super simple. Sounds interesting. I'm not going to <laughs> ask any more questions because probably I will never have 6.15 bitcoins. But okay. You know what? You can come uh, as my honored guest, Vlad. Um, but only if you like big titty bitches. If you don't, you're going to have to stay home. I mean, what's nuts like about that? <laughs> it's like the end game when i was a teenager that that was like the ultimate fantasy <laughs> uh you know per personally i'm more of like a good b cup like just you know perfect uh but it was just something that i noticed that the big titty women that they like a man with 6.15 bitcoin I mean, people with 6.15 Bitcoin are irresistible. They're charming. That's true. That's true. Presence, some kind of charisma that is hard to describe. <laughs> It's like you It's... grow some kind of aura around you, which glows all the time when you have 6.15 Bitcoin. That's right. That's right. Well, because, you know, it's like with a Lamborghini, when a girl sees a Lamborghini, she's thinking to herself, You know, maybe me and my offspring could ride in his Lamborghini with him. But when a girl sees you got 6.15 Bitcoin, she's like, maybe me and my offspring could fool Mars. You know what I mean? Which exactly. is a lot better. That's brilliant. And that's, <laughs> not, I mean, you should not underestimate the big hit bitches. <laughs> they get it. They see the potential in Bitcoin. <laughs> It's so it's so funny when you when I hear you say big tip bitches in your accent. It makes me it makes me laugh. I should say it more often then. <laughs> I mean it, it's not very easy to pronounce it's like big tip bitches. <laughs> Too many accents. Like hard I think it's very Yeah. As a native English speaker, I think it's very easy. Big titty bitches, bro. It just rolls right off the tongue. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. Or against you. <laughs> But I wouldn't mind some big titty bitches. And I guess I will have to label this episode as explicit when I upload. <laughs> so it doesn't get banned by <laughs> iTunes. Uh, that's fucking hilarious. But I guess people will listen no matter what. Oh, yeah. Bitcoiners don't give a fuck. <laughs> Bitcoiners are like, yeah, whatever, man. Even if they don't agree with what I'm saying and they think I'm like, you know, an asshole for saying it, they'll still be like, hey, fuck it. They're going to be like, oh, this guy made it. I should stack more sats. I hope that's what they... Well, you know, part of the reason why I do my sat stacking so publicly is because... You know, it's one thing to want to do, to want to create FOMO uh, amongst your no-coiner friends, but it's another thing to want to create FOMO amongst rabid Bitcoiners. You know what I mean? Because I know the Bitcoiners are going to stack it harder, and I know it's going to be, uh, it's, more, it's more trustworthy in their, in their capable hands, you know? I'd rather the Bitcoiners have it than the no-coiners. Yeah, Maybe. Sometimes I get jealous when I watch you stack sats and I say, okay, this guy is stacking so many sats and I, I, I have to wait until payday and maybe that half of my pay is going to be stacked. Maybe. 
if I get lucky and I eat mom's food for a month. Hey, that's, that's good though, man. There's always some sort of jealousy going on in Bitcoin. As long as it doesn't turn into envy, I think jealousy is a very helpful emotion. Um, because jealousy is basically, I want what you have, which is healthy. Because it might, it might propel you to get what I have, you know, to work harder and to get more. Um, but envy is, I want what you have so badly that I don't want you to have it. I'm going to take it away from you. Uh, that's what we see with, you know, socialist regime, regimes are all built on the feeling of envy. Yeah, and that feeling of entitlement that they should deserve right. have it. But, je- but jealousy is, is helpful. You know, I, I like jealousy. You know, I get jealous of other people all the time and uh, it motivates me to work harder. Exactly. It's like yep. something that makes you competitive and makes you want to become better. Right, right. Healthy. And by the way, since we started talking, I have stacked 8,000 sats by playing... Oh, sh- oh, yeah. Yeah. There's this Mario game on Satoshi's games. And it just helps me focus when I talk and do podcasts. I just play this. And if I manage to save Satoshi, who is like the replacement for Princess Peach, then I get the sats, I mean, the coins which I collected along the game. And I seem to have gotten very good. I should participate Mario tournaments or something because I keep on winning and stacking more sats. Tell me how many sats I should stack right now. I'm going to stack some. So you're going to stack some sats during this podcast. Yeah, you tell me how much. How many sats should I go for? You should go for 3 million just because Hadalo not said so. Okay, so that's like 300 bucks right now. Yeah, I'm not going to make you... Spend too much money, but it's not a lot I can eat for a month with that. All right, three hundred, three million. Let's see. Confirming. Oftentimes, Cash App is like, "Nah, you've stacked it too hard." Boom! There we go. Just got three million more. That's three million more. You motherfuckers are never gonna get. Those are mine now. <laughs> they were up for grabs, right? <laughs> now I'm gonna post on Twitter and be like, "Just stack these during a podcast with Vlad." <laughs> Yeah, you should. That's a great way of producing the episode. And I guess I'll do this and publish it as fast as I can. It's possibly the longest podcast that I have ever done. I'm not sure for how long we have spoken, but it didn't feel like long. No, it felt like it went really quick. Although I haven't eaten lunch, so I'm getting super fucking hungry. <laughs> yeah. There's this Alfred Hitchcock quote, and I know that you're into cinema. But he said that films should be just as long as the human bladder can take it. Yeah. I, Hitchcock has this amazing quote um, that he calls a uh, refrigerator moment. So like when you're watching a film and something doesn't quite make sense, but you just go with it, you know, because you're, you're suspended in the, uh, <laughs> you know, in the world of the film. And then later at night, when you're making yourself a sandwich at the refrigerator, you just go, huh, that didn't make any fucking sense. That's a, that's a refrigerator moment. And I always think about that one. So we should end this by referring to the refrigerator moments in Bitcoin. Was there one? What, or- what is the refrigerator moment in Bitcoin? Let me think about that. Um, like the moment where you go, Huh, that doesn't make any sense. I'll tell you, I've had refrigerator moments about you know, the Federal Reserve, a lot of them, uh, since I got into this. But about Bitcoin's architecture itself or the system itself, um, I haven't really had any. Everything makes a lot of sense. I think it's a very elegant system. I have a lot of shower moments about Bitcoin. Like I, I just stop it. Yes. And I just... Stay too much in the shower, not because I masturbate, but because I think about Bitcoin. <laughs> well, if you start thinking about big titty bitches, then you can start masturbating in the shower. And uh, that's how we should end this podcast. <laughs> Why think about them when I could just stack 6.15 Bitcoin? You know what? You just need to stack it harder. Get your 6.15. And then you're good, man. They'll just come to you. (laughs) 
<laughs> sure. You don't even have to go out looking for for them, you know. <laughs> They're gonna knock on my door and be like, "I heard you have six point one five Bitcoin." And then that's when they show up to your door in a towel. And then when you say, "Yeah, I do," then they just drop the towel. Sure, that's how <laughs> real world works. Yeah. Somebody was asked. Somebody was asking me, "What is the six point one five Bitcoin? Uh, what does that get women?" And I said. Here's what it gets you. It gets you a, a ripped husband with abs who always does the dishes, who's super supportive, who listens to all your stories, who knows the names of your friends. It also gets you a gay best friend to go shopping with, and it gets you the ruin and destruction of every bitch that ever crossed you. That's what 6.5115 Bitcoin gets you as a woman. Whoa. Yeah. Like There's something for it. There's something for everybody in 6.15 Bitcoin. I feel like this is unfair. We just get tits, but they get like a whole excellent way of living. Oh, dude. Yeah, it's always unfair. But you know what? I'll take the tits. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> women, all, women always get the better deal, you know? <laughs> I feel like we have had way too much fun doing this. I, I like this one. We'll have to do another one in like uh, like six months or something. Sure. I hope by then you'll have a story about the double of 6.15, which <laughs> probably gets you a nice piece of ass too. Uh, yeah. I For anybody who's listening, that story I told where I said I had 100 Bitcoin back in 2015, I never, that's not true. I've only ever had 6.15 Bitcoin. And that's the most you can have. That's, it's the theoretical max. Any more than that, you're just being a greedy asshole, you know? That's a fair amount, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like 60, 60K. That's good. You could buy a Corvette with that, you know? Her? <laughs> Not that you should. <laughs> you should buy Bitcoin instead. Uh, I think cars are the worst kind of investment ever. Oh, yeah, totally. Unless they're collectibles, but if they're brand new and manufactured, like, in a, they're not made by hand and they're made in mass production, then they're not going to have any kind of value. Even if they're collectible, you're not going to be able to drive them on the main roads in, in a couple decades. So what's the point, you know? Possibly. Yeah, but right. go and museums and stuff. And I guess there was yeah. about Bitcoin being the Model T of cryptocurrencies. And it was... Oh my God, I hate when people would say that. It was a fun story in 2017 when everybody was forking Bitcoin to increase the block size and possibly have faster confirmations and say, we have solved scalability and there is no way Bitcoin can do this. But no, you know, it's th that happened actually well before 2017. I, I heard people pitching that narrative in 2015. And the way they would say it is they would say, um, you know, it's always the third uh, <laughs> competitor that survives. Right. Like the first one breaches new territory and but then gets a lot of arrows in its back. The second one doesn't get it quite right. And then the third one learns the mistakes of the first two and and thrives, you know. And they were, they were all pitching their stuff as the Facebook. Remember when people were saying that Bitcoin was the MySpace of cryptocurrency? You remember that? Sure. Yeah, that, that pissed me off so bad. Because it's like, hey, you fucking idiots. Satoshi is one of the world's preeminent geniuses. And he was thinking 100 years ahead of the rest of us. Okay? <laughs> He's not just some asshole with an ICO. Like, the system architecture of Bitcoin is so elegant and amazing that and I don't know how it can be improved upon. In fact, the world's best and brightest just go into Bitcoin and try and make Bitcoin better rather than, you know, starting their own shitcoin. So when I would hear people say that, I would be like, either, you, you know, you're too dumb. You're, you're basically too dumb to know what's going on. And if you are, you shouldn't even be at this table, you know? Yeah. Well, let's end it with this very thoughtful note. Instead of just random big titty bitch talk. Exactly. It proves that we have brains and we can actually... This is true. Yeah. 
arguments that make sense. You know, somebody's going to take this meme one of these days and they're going to be like, they're going to be like, oh, Bitcoiners think women just are going to give them sex. <laughs> yeah, we're such misogynists. We're, there's such a bunch of misogynist assholes and all the women are going to be like, wait, do these guys really have 6.15 Bitcoin? Because if so, I'm in. I am in. Where do I sign up? The ladies, my phone number is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother. Hey, it was great talking to you, man. I'm going to let you go so I can go eat my, eat my lunch. Likewise. I have been sitting for too long and I feel like I should stretch. I know, I know right? <laughs> all right man talk to you later and i'm going to post this possibly in a few hours fuck yeah it was great hey it was great talking to you bud same love the work you're doing dude thanks <laughs> Just thought, you know, i try to find a purpose in this space and it's a privilege to be able to work for something which is noble in its intent and also pays you i mean okay why not Totally. And I appreciate that you're not uh, going the, the crypto, you know, route. I appreciate you doing it the right way. Maybe there's a donation of 6.15 Bitcoin in your future if you keep it up. I'm just saying. I'm awesome. not saying, but I'm just saying. Also, if there are any donations which are made to this show, I guess you don't want to get half of the Bitcoins because you're rich already. You have 6.15. No. But there you, you, no to... you take whatever comes in. <laughs> No, I'm going to give them to the cause of Ross Ulbricht because he needs oh, okay. it. Without him, basically, maybe that we wouldn't be here today. Yeah, unfortunately, Ross is fucked. I mean, they're never going to let him out of that cage. They have him in. Unless, you know, we all gain power uh, in our late 40s and early 50s and we're able to make sure it happens. I, I would like to see him freed, but I don't, I don't think there's much of a chance. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's not a, I, I think they should, everybody should keep fighting the good fight, but I feel bad for Ross. It makes me really sad. Like that Twitter account that tweets his stuff from prison. Oh man, that shit makes me sad. It makes me really sad. Okay. So whatever amount I'm going to get by donation, hypothetically, because I never really get any, is going to go to Ross. <laughs> I know, right? Bitcoiners are too frugal. They won't, they, won't, they won't give you any money. Yeah, that's why I made a Patreon where you can donate $1. You know what? I'm going to donate. Oh, okay. That's... I'm going to go do it right after I eat this steak. <laughs> you have basically ticked all the boxes for being a Bitcoin maximalist. You ended up... I know, right? Exactly. I'm actually going to eat a steak salad. So it's a little gay. All right. But hey, try and watch my girlish figure here. Okay. At least you're not talking about going to shoot your gun at the range maybe a couple of hours later. <laughs> well, I do own a lot of guns, Vlad. Okay. Quite a few. Quite a few. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, brother. It was great talking to you, man. Talk to you later. Bye.